the briny deep, the high seas. Davy Jones Locker. Whatever you call it, there's no question that the oceans are host to myriad species of immense biodiversity. Once thought to be infinite, the bounties of the ocean were fished as long as history can recount. Speak today to one of the more nostalgic members of the fishing community and you'll be regaled with tales of monstrous bass. But truth be told, since the 19th century, many things have changed. I'm Tyler Morgan and today I'm going to be discussing some of the more unpredictable consequences of overfishing. Now, fishing has been used throughout history for many different purposes. Two of the main ones today are food and recreation. To a sports fisherman, fishing is a serene pastime of catch and release. But when you cast your attention to some of the industrial methods today, the strategies employed seem to be ever growing as more savage than technologically advanced as they would lead you to believe. Now, I could use photos out of context all I want to persuade you, but for the sake of fairness, let's take a look at some recent statistical evidence to get a general scope of the true issue at hand. The National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration recently did a report for the 2016 to 2017 changes in fish stocks on the USA. Now, when you look at their initial statistics, you can tell that three have been removed from the overfished list and three stocks have been added to the rebuilt list. And you can look through more of their stocks to see that in fact, some were just replaced completely with an entirely new fish stock that went down into the overfishing zone. So it's a little hard to tell whether we've improved or not, but their statistics seem to say we do. But they also gave us a map. And the map gives us a general overview of how much is being overfished currently and how much is already overfished, which means it's beyond its capacity to regrow after you've fished the quantity that we're taking from it, the quantity that we need. And when you look at the map, it's not too bad. It's only every single coastal state of the USA. And maybe it's a little unfair to point that out, but they also gave us a much broader view on their percentages from the total amount of fish stocks that have been depleted. And when you look at it, 9% are being overfished and 15% have already been overfished. Now, there's a reason one of those numbers is a little bit larger than the other one taking into consideration the total amount of fisheries. And that is something that requires a little bit of knowledge of environmental science. Marine ecosystems are naturally sensitive to changes in their trophic levels, which leaves them very vulnerable to a thing called a trophic cascade. Now, what this is roughly described as is a removal of a key species that results in a rippling effect to the trophic levels below. Now, what this takes the form of is often a predator at the top can be removed. This is what's called top-down control, which increases their prey since they're not being hunted anymore, which does the same thing. It's a ladder effect as it goes down, the prey increases as the predators decrease, and that keeps happening all the way to the bottom of the food chain. One example of this actually happened with the North Atlantic cod. Kenneth T. Frank submitted a report on this North Atlantic cod population and monitored it with reference to a trophic cascade. And what essentially happened with the North Atlantic cod was the Canadian government was too slow to respond to the drop in the populations of cod as their technologies increased and they caught more and more. Well, as they caught enough of them, the smaller prey fish, just like the description of a top-down control, began to increase rapidly, which resulted in a decrease in the zooplankton, which was the prey fish's prey, which resulted in an increase in the populations of phytoplankton. Now the problem with this is that phytoplankton feed on nitrates, and nitrates are a limiting factor in marine environments. What this essentially did was create a dead zone, is what they called it, and it made it impossible, or nearly impossible, for large fish to be sustained. In fact, it can barely support the prey fish, even when they're not being fished upon, because the nitrate levels are far too low. The interesting takeaway from the North Atlantic cod is that it actually proved irreversible. To this day, it hasn't been able to rehabilitate due to the fact that the nitrate levels are so low. Though it slowly showed some steady progress, but it needs to have a complete cessation of fishing, otherwise the pressure will always be too high and it will probably be far too many years to count for the fisheries to remain stable in those areas. Now, 
There was another example, and it's still ongoing to this day, where fish populations were resulted in their loss, um, a, another form of trophic cascade, but it wasn't entirely destructive. In the Caribbean, there's two varieties of sea sponge. Now, one of these is very slow growing and emits chemical defenses to stop it from getting eaten by special fish, while another doesn't have those chemical defenses and is considered more edible, but it is very fast growing. And typically, the way the environment selects is that the more edible sea sponge is left hiding in crevices where it can't be reached by particular fish, while the other one slowly grows and keeps a certain balance between the coral and the sponges. Well, when parrotfish, which had a special jaw that could eat these edible um, sea sponges, were removed by overfishing in certain areas, Salem Low discovered that their populations began booming exponentially. As they did this, they began to work in direct competition with the coral in the environment, as well as the other sea sponges. The way this worked was pretty pretty unique because overfishing literally hijacked the natural selective process of the Caribbean, and it's observed to this day. It gets more and more devastating, and it seems to be irreversible because of one also very unique thing about the Caribbean is that it has a very high concentration of dissolved carbon, which essentially makes it impossible to starve the sponges out. So literally the only factor that was dominating these sponges was the parrotfish and the few other fish that had specialized jaws to eat them. The direct effects of overfishing are pretty straightforward, reduction in fish population. But what these two examples indicate is the more indirect effects that few people have to truly try and consider. And that's because our understanding of marine ecology simply doesn't keep pace with our technologies, trawls, and nets that we throw at fish and hope to get enough of it to supply the demand. If we approach this without a sustainable method, we're soon going to find more and more examples like this, and my fear is that they'll always be irreversible.